thank you guys for joining uh, really appreciate it uh, uh, middle of the week middle of the day uh, welcome ranjit uh, uh, we have been of course trying to do this since uh, since one year now last year also around the same time we tried to do it uh, but covid blocked it um, so i'll just introduce nexus to you for those of you who don't know nexus uh, and uh, and then i'll throw the ball in your in, in ranjit's court and uh, and uh, and we'll hear from ranjit uh, so Nexus is a is a 17 year old fund. We manage about two billion dollars of assets. Uh, we invest uh, at very early stage, seed stage, uh, Series A stage. Uh, typically, we are typically the first institutional investor uh, in a company. Uh, we are first. Uh, we are early investors in uh, Postman, Delivery, uh, Infra Market, An Academy, uh, Dhruva, Pubmatic, uh, Kaltura, and of course uh, Pratilipi. Uh, I joined the industry about six, seven years back, uh, and and uh, Sandeep and I got a chance to invest in Pratilipi uh, about five and five and a half years back. Uh, and uh, and you know, founders of course grow with companies, team members grow with companies, but VCs also get a chance uh, to grow as the company grows. Uh, so I've been lucky to be uh, working with Ranjit uh, for the past five years. Uh, uh, if uh, yeah, there's there are, there are some people trickling in. Uh, maybe maybe we'll start uh, with with Ranjit. Um, Ranjit, it would be fantastic. First of all, welcome. Uh, it would be fantastic if you could please introduce yourself, introduce Pratilibi, how it started, how like what was what where where do you come from? What was the what was the genesis of Pratilibi? It would be fantastic to learn about the background about you and the company. Uh, and let's take it forward from there. Yeah. So thanks a lot for having me here. First of all. Um, so essentially, let me start with the real story of how Pratilipi started. And I think I have shared that at quite a few places, but still. And then I'll also start uh, talk a little bit about the rational side of why Pratilipi kind of made sense for us. Um, so the personal side or the real story basically is that I was born in a very small village, less than 1,000 population village in Raiburi, uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, typically in my village, most people don't speak English. Most people are not very tech savvy. If you generally make like seven, 8,000 a month, you are decidedly rich and among the best earning people in the village. Um, on the side of it, I have been a voracious reader. I probably read more than most people. I used to read like uh, 130, 140 books a year. Even today, if I'm not working or playing cricket, chances are that I'm reading something. Um, so it started by reading comics, like most people. Uh, then started reading classical Hindi literature, then started reading contemporary Hindi literature. Um, and then when I went on to pursue my engineering, uh, from KIT Bhuneshwar. There, I realized that Hindi content was simply not available as much. So offline bookstores can only carry max a couple of thousand titles. Online, there really wasn't anything back in 2006. So I shifted to reading English, but I also started cribbing to my friends that this seems ridiculous. It should be my choice if I want to read Hindi or English or French or Marathi or whatever else. It should not be because of lack of access. Uh, obviously, coming from a lower middle class family did not really do anything about it at the time. My family essentially said that you should have a backup option. So go and do a job for a couple of years and then do whatever you want. So I went and pursued my MBA uh, from FMS Delhi and then worked in Vodafone for a couple of years. There I was doing a little too well. Uh, I was one of their best employees forever. And I thought when you are 24 and you are best ever at anything, you're in the wrong place. Uh, so decided to get my job. Plan was to find a startup uh, and join them as an early employee. Uh, took about four months to travel around the country, met a bunch of founders, liked some, did not like anybody enough to bet for a job. Uh, and around this time, some of my friends called me back and said that, you know, you've been talking about this problem for a long time now. And considering nobody seems to be solving it, why don't you give it a shot? I thought makes sense. Uh, but also that is how I found some of my co-founders, some of our early employees and so on and so forth. So my first co-founder was, for example, my school batchmate. Uh, another was engineering college batchmate. Another was batchmate from MBA. And there was a colleague from Vodafone. Our first employee was my senior at Vodafone. First product manager was my batchmate and so on and so forth. Uh, so this was the real story of how Pratiti started. The rational side of the story, I think, is now fairly well understood, but it wasn't really that much of a case back in 2014, which was basically India is about 16.5% of world's population. And 90% of India doesn't really either read or write or speak in English. Uh, we generally prefer, in some cases, uh, it's not even a choice. It's like that is the only language that I know. In some cases, it's by choice that we prefer to read, write, and speak in one of the many, many Indian languages and dialects. And yet, online, even today, despite the fact that uh, YouTube, uh, Daily Hunt, Share Chat, Patlipi, and a bunch of others 
are trying to kind of increase the quantity of content in Indian languages, we still have less than 1% of online content in all Indian languages combined. And that just seems ridiculous. So our thesis was that there has to be a platform where there is a lot more Indian language content. Second part, uh, so this was more about like why something within Indian languages. The second part was more about why Prathipi specifically. So I think in general, I have been very, very okay with failure. I've been very, very okay with short-term queues or short-term people not understanding what we are doing and so on and so forth. But I also wanted to make sure that uh, if we have to fail, I would rather prefer failing in a year by spending like close to zero money uh, versus spending up, like failing after 15 years having spent like a billion dollars. So we wanted to build a company which has a strong network effects once you get to steady state. We wanted to build a company where the content has high shelf value. And we wanted to build something that can essentially scale both uh, in depth, which means like the type of content and so on and so forth, but also horizontally, which means that different geographies, different languages, different formats and so on and so forth. And that is how kind of Pratlipi made sense, which is why we have always focused on long form, high shelf type content uh, even when we expand into newer formats, that is something that has remained kind of constant. So that's uh, basically the rational side of why we started building really Pratlipi. For people who might not be aware, Pratlipi is essentially an Indian language storytelling platform. What that basically means is people come onto platform and they share their stories with the rest of the world. We started by building a literature platform, uh, which is called Pratlipi. So people come and publish their stories, novels, books, serialized literature, essays, and stuff like that. Other people basically come and read them and they can interact with each other. Then about a year, year and a half back, uh, when we became confident that literature seems to be working is when we started expanding from there. Uh, so we launched uh, Pratipi Comics, which is like the comics version of Pratipi. So you can go and read comics in five languages now. Uh, we launched Pratipi FM, which is like the audio version of Pratipi. So you can go and listen to audio shows, podcasts, uh, audio books, audio stories uh, on Pratipi FM, I think in 11 languages. Then we acquired two companies. One is called IBM Podcast, which has been the largest podcasting studio in India. And another is a company called Right Order, which publishes physical books and physical comics. For other formats uh, where we don't have a product, for whatever reason, uh, we license these stories to other people, like our ecosystem partners, who can basically tell these stories in other formats. So our first such uh, web series was launched on MX Player two months back, for example. We have now published about uh, 100 traditional books uh, working with different traditional publishers and so on and so forth. So this is basically what Pratipi is. Awesome. Uh, and Ranjit, looking with the advantage of hindsight, it's of course, uh, it of course seems easy to appreciate that the market size was supposed to be large and there was a lot of demand. But when you started six years back, the market was not as obvious. Uh, it was not that the, the Indian language content space was not hot, maybe of course, we do had started the idea, but beyond that, there was nothing else. What were the questions people were asking then, uh, investors, <laughs> uh, potential employees, and how did you counter that? Like market size, understandably, was a question for most people then. Uh, would people read uh, was a question then. So what were the questions and how did you counter that? So broadly, I think there were three lines of questions. One, which actually kind of remakes sense rationally speaking, which was around timing. Uh, so a lot of people who actually were interested in what we were doing and who were interested in the market basically said that, you know, we have been waiting for this to happen for like many, many years now. Uh, and when is that going to happen? We don't know if it's going to happen in six months or six years or whatever else. And my comeback basically, and which is still the case, is that as a founder, I don't really care if the timing is off or on or whatever. Uh, unlike a fund which has a 10-year, 12-year life cycle, uh, I have the next 40 years to build the most iconic company that I can build. So even if it happens in five years or 10 years, it's still fine as long as I know for a fact that it's going to happen. And then the premise is like, if you genuinely believe that it's going to happen, even if it's five years or 10 years out, even as an investor, essentially, if you know that you are going to get a 100x return or 1000x return in the next 10 years, isn't that better than getting a 5x return in two years? Uh, obviously, for most people, that which doesn't really work, but for some people, it kind of works. Uh, so that was one. Like as a founder, I can afford to take a much, much longer time horizon view versus what an investor can take. The second question, uh, which was, in my opinion, a ridiculous question was that, is it ever going to the case that people will consume long form content on mobile? Uh, in fact, some people basically said that nobody's going to, like mobile is such a small screen device and nobody's really going to spend half an hour on mobile. Uh, so some people said that generally, some people said that specifically for reading, that's definitely not going to be the case. My counter to that, the first part, which again, seems ridiculous in retrospect was that people are already using mobile for YouTube and Facebook and whatnot. Uh, and at that time, of course, the numbers were lower than what they are right now, but it was quite obvious that that is going to be the case. Like 
if you look at it from let's say 10 15 years back uh, what people were doing with mobile versus what people were doing let's say 7 years back it was obvious that more and more people were using mobile as their primary communication device as well as primary content creation consumption device there was no reason whatsoever that that's not going to be the case in the next 5 10 15 years um, people counter that by saying that you know youtube is for example video facebook is basically social media and so on and so forth. and again my advice was like it's never going to be the case that there is an exact same company that is doing exactly same as i am doing and somehow uh, Prathipi still makes sense. Like if there's somebody who's already doing what we are doing at a large enough scale, then Prathipi any which case doesn't make sense. So you have to take a leap of faith. Uh, so that was second question, line of questioning essentially. Also because there wasn't really a like direct analog anywhere in the world. I think China literature and Wattpad and Kindle were probably, and YouTube were probably like the closest analogs, but all of these were also kind of different. Uh, which is why in fact, if you look at our first deck that, so most of the stuff about Prathipi is publicly available on Google, if you search enough. So early on, we started calling Prathipi as Kindle Direct Publishing because that's what people freaking understood. Uh, then we started saying that, okay, Prathipi is something like YouTube or Medium because that is what people understood. Uh, but it was like, there wasn't really a direct analog. So it was hard to kind of explain what we are trying to do at the time at least. Uh, third was, I think, again, more understandable. So I think first and third were queries or let's say doubts, which are quite understandable. Second one, I think is ridiculous. Third one was that in India, we had never seen UGC companies being built. Uh, like companies that are supposed to not make money at all. I think there was so much ridicule, ridicule, ridicule around companies that were not making profits, right? Like people used to write way too often about Flipkart that uh, like GMV is vanity and revenue is vanity and like people are not making any profits and they are going to shut down and Amazon will kill everyone and so on and so forth. Now imagine a company that doesn't even make revenue, like forget about profits. Uh, so I think, uh, like particularly, I think Prathipi and Shilshat, I think we kind of taught the market to a large extent that what the hell is UGC and why there are certain kind of companies where monetization is not just needed in early days, but it's actively bad strategy to pursue monetization till you get to critical mass. Uh, but again, I think this was a valid line of questioning because it's not very intuitive to think that there should exist a company that has zero revenue and that's valued at whatever, 2 million, 3 million, 5 million, 50 million. Uh, so it was a valid concern, especially for people who hadn't seen that happen at the time. So I think these were primarily the three kind of major concerns that came along. First and third, in my opinion, were valid. Uh, second, not so much. Makes sense. And you know, one, I remember one discussion we had, I asked uh, ki how many books are published in India or how many people read oh, books. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and I distinctly remember the argument you made that the number was reasonably small, practically. The argument you made, made was that if you increase accessibility and affordability, then market size expands and most investors underestimate that power. And I, I that, that has stuck in my mind because I've used that principle in hundreds of pitches post that. And, and that to me is... Actually, in fact, that was probably a bigger concern. I should have covered that as reason number four, which was basically like, what is the size of the offline market? And then people, especially people who are coming from consulting background or banking background will basically say, okay, the market size is whatever. $3 billion, $8 billion, you will take a percentage of that. So let's say you take 10% of that. That means your market is $30 million, $300 million, depending on the market size. Uh, and my comeback, and again, most people did not really buy that. Some people did, was that generally the best companies of each generation, each market, uh, essentially don't take a share of the market. That's not how it works. And that's not true about Pratlipi. That is true for everything from Facebook to Tesla to SpaceX to Coinbase to whoever else you think of. The best companies expand the market because they either like ridiculously lower the price or they ridiculously improve uh, like just the ability to kind of become a supplier uh, or just like how easy it is to do something. Uh, and like the basic premise was that the current market is X, but if we do our job well, it's not that we are going to take a share of the market. It's like we are going to expand the market by 30X or 50X or 5,000X. Uh, and like best examples probably are like something like Airbnb, for example, uh, or a YouTube, for example, the number of video creators before YouTube came along essentially meant like people who could make a freaking movie. And that would have been like, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 in the world. Now there might be 5,000 YouTube video creators in Bangalore alone. So I think, again, one of the questions that I think is ridiculous, especially if your job is to invest in the best companies possible, but that, that was a concern for some people. Makes sense. Uh, uh, switching gears, and uh, so understandably, it is a two-side marketplace. Uh, and there are readers and writers, uh, but without readers, writers will not come without writers, readers will not come. So how did you prime the pump? What was more important for you in early days? And when did you realize that 
the pump has been primed and and it it will it will move on on its own right so to be <coughs> to be honest one disclaimer so i think this has been like uh, one of the three big mistakes that i have made as a ceo uh, and something that i now advise other founders against uh, so generally for marketplaces you typically do need to seed one way or another otherwise it just takes longer to get to liquid uh in pratipi early days was a two sided marketplace now it has become more of a multimodal marketplace but the concept is still applies and the concept is still exactly the same uh which is basically as you rightly said that unless you have writers why would readers come and unless you have readers why would writers come uh in our, our case the approach that we took was that because we are going to be focusing on high shelf life content uh which means that we should be focusing on supply because whatever supply i acquire today is not just going to be valuable for consumers today but it's also going to be valuable for consumers after 2 years or 3 years or 5 years ten years so we focused almost exclusively like 95% on seeding supply but not enough not nearly enough in retrospect uh so the first thing that we did was essentially getting public domain content uh, and different countries would have slightly different laws around this but in india essentially what that at a high level means is that once a writer passes away uh 60 years post that the content gets into public domain which means that you can do whatever you want with it so what we did was we got that content on the public domain the second thing that we did was that um, and both of these were done pre launch uh was that before even deciding to build pratipi i had spoken with about 350 to 400 odd authors in trying to understand why does this problem even exist in the first place like why hasn't somebody else solved it uh so i reached out to these people and said that you know we are basically trying to save, solve this problem and uh, would you like to help us and most people said no funnily enough uh but essentially their premise was that uh, like if there are no readers then like why would i take the effort to basically make an account and upload a content and all of that and then some people are simply not tech savvy enough to do that uh we basically solved that by saying that you know all you have to do is say yes we will do everything else for you so like we will make your account we will upload your content uh, if there are people who are reading your stories we'll tell you people are giving any feedback about your stories will tell you as so on so forth so we just got these writers the mistake that we did was that we stopped here and we said that you know we are building the right product we started focusing a lot on making sure that our writers are feeling the happiest possible we focused a lot on our customer nps both on reader and writer side but we did not actively try and seed it more and more and which meant that uh, it took us longer to get to enough critical mass uh, but once you get to critical mass then essentially what starts happening and i'm not sure if you remember to think i had a graph in the seed deck that what happens is that if you have published something from a writer that writer is going to share it with his friends and his family because well it's my story uh and then those readers will basically come and they will read that story some part of those readers will essentially read other stories uh and then some of these people will essentially start reviewing or liking or rating and then some of these people uh will basically think that you know what i have read 10 20 30 stories and i also want to share a story so they will become writers themselves Uh, and once that happens then they share the same story with their friends and their family so like once you get to that point then the loop kind of starts working and then it's a lot easier to kind of grow from there uh so we took i think maybe about 3 and 1/2 4 years to basically get to that point where that started becoming obvious but after that of course things become a little bit easier yeah and by the way you know about it so my 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 father started reading on the libi and over time said well i want to write as well and then he started writing as well now of course he's that his writing get a lot of uh, views but every comment he gets like that day is half day of happiness is because of that comment and and that's what writer craves for that someone loves his content so much uh, that someone commented that great job or something so incidentally i was talking to a founder yesterday uh, i think suveer connected me to the founder in fact where he wanted to talk to me just to say thanks because his wife has started writing uh, on pratipi very actively in the last two months uh and she gets like a hundred reviews or comments every day and he's like uh, my two sons both of them are living outside india and like i and my wife used to basically talk about like what do we do for the entire day like there's no new motivation the company is work like his company is working very well um and now his wife is like every day he comes home she has like okay see this is what people have said about my story this is what people have said about my story this is what people have said about my story so i think once you start getting that reader feedback it's amazing awesome uh, and creator love aside uh, ranjit a lot of people have have been asking this question to me on twitter as well that what is what are the metrics that pratipi focuses on and the context there is this we could focus on growth we could focus on engagement we could focus on retention we could focus on monetization all all metrics are good all metrics are important but how do you focus on which metric at what time of your journey would good to discuss on that 
right so my thought process is that uh, like there has to be something that basically tells you are you moving in the right direction and that has to be a north star like what is the best proxy metric that you can have which kind of gives you a high level of idea in terms of whether you are doing the right things or not and after that obviously uh, in a consumer driven company particularly but also in all kind of companies there would always be like 300 other metrics that you would track but at a high level there has to be something that tells you whether you are moving in the right direction and which is what most people define as north star Uh, so for us, for literature product, for example, we have two north stars. Uh, one is stories read, one is stories published. And why stories read and not MAU, for example, because for something like Pratlipi, uh, if you are not reading something, you are not necessarily getting value out of the platform. Just because you open the app doesn't really mean you are getting enough value. And which is why, like the best proxy has to be something that captures the fact that you are getting enough value from the platform. So stories read will take care of almost everything else, including like what is new acquisition, what is engagement, what is retention, what is frequency, and so on and so forth. Similarly, stories published will take care of that the writer will not come and publish a new story unless they were getting enough value from the platform, which could have been revenue, which could be feedback, which could be listenership, which could be viewership, something else, whatever. So these two metrics become our north stars. Then we also wanted to have two metrics to make sure that we are achieving these in the right manner and not basically taking shortcuts. uh so one check metric is nps which is like what do our readers and writers think about us and the second is completion rate because that tells us that we are not optimizing for content uh, which is not very valuable uh, which might be for example let's say clickbait and that is why people come and click on that or for example something that is very uh, very small in terms of length so more people are reading that so completion rate and nps combined make sure that we are achieving our north stars in the right manner possible outside of these four metrics there would be a lot of tactical metrics that we we'll look at on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis depending on what we are trying to optimize that week or that month but these are the key metrics that we look at uh and someone is asking this question which i think is relevant at this point how does patlip think about monetization mm-hmm. uh, what is the long term <clears throat> plan uh and and what is your uh, what, what has been done till now and what what do you expect in future sure So let me start with a bit of a generic gyan, uh, and then I'll get to Pratipi specifically. <clears throat> so I think any company, uh, or for people by the way who are here, as I said earlier, like I made three big strategic mistakes as a CEO. One of those was that I did not seed the marketplace enough. The second one was I spent way too much time thinking about monetization, which was absolutely ridiculous and the waste of freaking time. Uh, like I would have spent easily thousand plus hours just thinking and worrying about monetization. uh but like my nuanced view now after i have already made that screw up is essentially that as a founder slash product manager depending on the context you need to have a fair bit of idea about how do you become unit economics profitable like actual economics doesn't matter uh, central cost uh, matter obviously but that's more of a cash flow issue than a strategy issue. but unit economics is a strategy issue it's not just a cash flow issue so if your unit cost is zero for example uh for something like let's say a pratipi or a share chat where if you are not paying for content and if you are not spending that much money on marketing uh then essentially your unit cost is basically just the cost of storing that content and serving that customer in those cases generally you should worry as little about monetization as possible monetization is just and the feature basically versus for some other platform where there is a cost associated with every unit product for example let's say if you are buying something and then you are selling something to your customers you need to have a fair bit of idea and fair bit i would say like with 95% plus accuracy that i have to be able to make enough money at steady state where i am making more money than what i have paid for this product uh similarly for enterprise companies for example where you need somebody to go and sell that product you need to figure out with 95% plus accuracy uh in terms of like how are you going to cover for the cost of that sales person if nothing else so that is more of a general advice so for a lot of founders now for example for bunch of founders i tell them like you are not thinking enough about monetization and you should be worrying like shitless about this and there are a bunch of other founders where i say that you know like why are you even thinking about monetization any vc who even ask that how do you monetize uh, is not worth your time they don't understand how consumer internet works just freaking move on so if your unit cost is zero don't worry about monetization if your unit cost is low worry a little bit if your unit cost is high like that should be your number one priority that's it uh now coming to pratipi's specific case and i think now i can answer this a little better because we have multiple products all of which have different unit cost and which is why our strategies are different so take pratipi like literature as example pratipi's literature product our unit cost are very very close to zero we don't pay our creators unless there is a revenue associated with it and then they get a share of that revenue which means that unit cost is literally very close to zero which means that monetization even though we have launched about 3 months back that's not really the main concern 
the way literature monetizes right now, at least, is a combination of three parts, and we will launch a fourth part in maybe two years. First part is for the absolutely top creators, like absolutely best of the best stories. We'll acquire these stories uh, by Pratiki, where we will pay the writers upfront amount of money. And then we will license these stories either to our own different verticals or to third party ecosystem partners. So for example, take, let's say, uh, there's a story series uh, published on Pratiki called Murdo Ki Train. So we acquired the rights for that story. We converted that into a comics, which was published on Pratiki Comics. We converted that into audio series, which becomes on Pratiki FM. Uh, we like we are currently making a web series based on a Murdoki train, uh, which will be launched on a OTT platform. We have published that as a physical comic series and a physical book series. And in all of these cases, the writer will get a share of revenue, Pratik will get a share of revenue. So that's for the top tier stories. Just below that, uh, like there are every writer is allowed to have one series uh, as a part of creator subscription. So basically, again, almost all of the content on Pratik is free. But if as a reader, you want to support a creator, you can subscribe to that creator. In return, you will get some exclusive features. You'll get some early access content. And in future, you will get some exclusive content. And again, whatever is the subscription price, some amount is uh, given to writers, some amount comes to Pratipi. Uh, then the third part is Pratipi Premium, which is basically that you get all the content-related benefits, but not the feature-related benefits. Uh, so like, for example, all the early access content, all the exclusive content you can access on the platform across the creators. Uh, and then again, the, the entire subscription amount is shared between the writer and the thing. So these are the three parts that we have already launched. And then like for the creators just below this, who are not good enough or popular enough right now to get more subscribers or to get their IP acquired, for them, we'll launch some kind of advertisement policy, uh, maybe in a year or two years, where again, these creators can make some money out of it. So this was one example. Now think of a different example, like let's say Pratibi Comics. In Pratibi Comics, there are a lot of comics that basically we are financing. So we take the story and then we are financing the conversion of that story into becoming a comic. So then there's a variable cost attached. In those cases, we launch monetization like within three, four, five months of product launch or maybe six months of product launch. So there the way revenue works is that the same comic, uh, like any comic is typically released on a weekly schedule. If you want to read today's release today, you have to pay a very small amount of money to unlock that chapter, or you can wait for a week and the chapter becomes free and you can read it for free. And that's that. Uh, the third example would be, let's say something like a physical book uh, or something like IBM podcast. In both these cases, there is a cost attached to just getting the first print out itself. Like every time I publish a new book, uh, there's some money that I have to pay to the printer to actually print that. Same for IBM. Like every time a podcast, we create a podcast, there's some money that we have to pay to sound engineers, to editors, uh, to the person himself who is basically creating the podcast and so on and so forth. So in both of these cases, they have to monetize on day zero and they have to be trying, they have to try and get to cash flow positive as quickly as possible. So our publishing arm actually became cash flow positive last month. Uh, and IBM will become cash flow positive before this and before the end of this year. But uh, like literature or comics, for example, they will likely take another two, three years to become cash flow positive, and that's completely fine. I think this is this is one feedback for a lot of entrepreneurs that you cannot paint all the companies with the same brush. Uh, different models require different monetization proof points. And both investors and entrepreneurs should be debating on those lines, whether that model requires, what, what is the unit economics of that model at scale and, and, and work backwards and not have, not have the standard, uh, standard answer for, for all the companies. I think very, very relevant. And lots of people ask this question to me. So I definitely wanted to bring it up. Uh, uh, Ranjit, one other thing I have seen people ask me a lot is I think uh, there is a lot of curiosity to understand who is the user of Pratibi. Uh, so I meet many people who say uh, my parents are fanatic users. So their bias is older people use it. Mm -hmm. You and I know numbers don't show that. Uh, people have a lot of curiosity around what type of content works on Pratibi. Uh, thriller, horror, romance, what works on Pratibi. So whatever you can share uh, around around what are the counterintuitive insights based on the data you have seen in Patilipi, I think it will be relevant for you. Sure. From a demographic perspective, actually, uh, like my almost all of my habits turned out to be wrong. Uh, so when we started building Patilipi, we had thought that majority of our users would be in tier three, tier four, tier five places. Uh, we thought that majority of users would be older people, and we thought majority of people would be like males. Uh, and there's a logic to all of that, right? Like we assume that. Like if you're talking about Indian languages and in English, we knew early on at least that we were not going to be winning against Kindle and Medium and Wattpad in year one or year two or year three at least. Uh, and then men, for example, simply because, well, in India, mostly men have much higher internet penetration than women. Like 
typically at least if i remember correctly about a year back uh, women only comprised of about 20 21% of internet users in india and uh, older people because well older people kind of just like to read more and people said that younger people have multiple other options they can go and play pubg they can go and uh, watch a movie they can go and play cricket outside and so on so forth turned out all of these three were wrong uh, so as of today for example uh, about 47% of our users come from top seven cities this number used to be about 55% till about a year back uh, 3% of our users come from outside india and about 50% of our users come from smaller places uh, similarly in terms of gender women are actually about 51 52% of our users and this number used to be about 60% two years back uh, and men are actually less than 50% there is still about 48 49% of our users uh, similarly in terms of age the biggest age group is actually between 18 to 34 which is about 63 64% of our users again in retrospect i can justify all of these younger people for example simply have like higher internet connectivity as i said so it's not about prakriti most companies would have a younger user base in india because india is a young country like there are just more younger people than older people and that's simply that uh men versus women i think the other logic held that women have lesser options as of today on the internet versus men have just far too many options uh and metro versus non metro i think largely is about that we have grown more from word of mouth slash surge and less from performance marketing which meant that like people who knew about prakriti in the beginning days were our friends and people that we knew and they were mostly living and working in metros and because we grew more in concentric circles uh, which meant that these people just grew at a faster pace early on and now of course tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 is growing at a much much faster pace it's just that uh, like the metros had a bigger lead early on so like which is why a year back it was about 53 54% and now it's 47 so tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 is obviously growing faster it will just take more time before it becomes 70 80 90% which will happen it will just take some time the second part is about genres or categories uh, here there we were actually a lot more strategic in nature so one advantage of learning slash reading a lot is essentially that you don't have to make all the mistakes yourself you can learn from other people's mistakes and make new mistakes so one of the things that we learned was that a lot of companies essentially make one of the two mistakes either they become too focused for way too long in which case basically uh, like the size of the problem that they can solve becomes very, very difficult because people are just used to thinking of you in a certain manner uh, and the other way other mistake that a lot of smart people make which is more common is that people just try and do too many things right at get go which means that you are not good enough on any of those things and then you basically just fail so we are very very clear, careful about how we expand so we were clear for example that we will only focus on one format till the time we have won that format and which is why we only focused on long form text as against anything else for the first four years we would not do uh, physical books will not do audio will not do video will not do like whatever else short form content and news and jokes and whatever else Uh, on the other hand we knew that we wanted to be horizontal enough so which is why from very very early on we were very very clear that we did not want to be a romance platform or horror platform or suspense platform or thriller platform or whatever else so we were very very clear that we wanted to have multiple genres a lot of times that meant that we took trade offs where we would actually trade like accept lower growth just to make sure that we have higher diversity of the type of content that we have so today for example suspense and thriller is the largest category on prithvi uh, which is about 11% Uh, romance and love is the second largest category about 10% and then horror is the third largest category about 9% but all of these top three categories combined is still about 30% uh, as against like one category being 50% of the content so that was more of a strategic choice and it is still is a strategic choice that we have been trying to follow makes sense and i will also add anjit that one good strategic choice you made uh, a few years back and when we were meeting investors for the next round almost everyone who asked this question when would you launch english mm-hmm. and the argument you made was that we are too small to launch english if you launch english right now then eventually will become an english platform because 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 the breadth is not there and but but when we became large enough then you, then launching english was actually good for the platform because multiple people know two languages and and they want to work uh, one more that was also the reason why for example we did not allow publishers to start publishing on prithvi like till the time that the base is large enough if there is one uh, either author or one publisher or one language that basically becomes a dominant part of your ecosystem then it's very very hard to stay broad enough uh, so now for example we are actually getting uh, publisher content on the platform but that is because we are like 30 million monthly active users so we can afford to essentially have a creator who has like a million readers we couldn't afford to do that when overall users that we had was half million makes sense uh changing gears completely because lots of people have been talking about this now given uh, early successes of uh, of animal early successes of kutum 
uh, there is something unique about the Philippine culture, right? So uh, it's most many most people in the firm have grown from within. Uh, the NPS is very very high. Most companies don't even measure NPS. Our NPS last we measured was seventy or 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 eighty, uh, which is which is phenomenal. Uh, we have had very 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 few attritions uh, in in the company. So there's there's something right about about that. So would be would be good to get your perspective on what has worked right in Patilipi. How does how does Patilipi nurture talent, and 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 when when people have started new companies, what how has that experience been like uh, for the for the company as a whole? Right. So I want to start off with two again generic points before getting specific. So I think in general, what we have tried and do is that we have tried to learn from other people both on the good side and the negative sides and try and make new mistakes instead of repeating the mistakes. So globally, there are a bunch of companies but in India, particularly I think uh, Kunal Shah from like earlier free charge and then Crit and uh, Sachin and Bini from Flipkart, I think build companies that at least at that point in time had insanely good uh, culture. And we essentially just picked a lot of stuff from there and said like, okay, uh, this is what Flipkart has done. This is what free charge has done. Now, can we take it a step further? Can we do it even better than what they have done? So that has been a big focus. Second was that we have always wanted to make sure that people never have to watch their backs. Uh, so our first company value, for example, is literally the number one company value is just try and do the right thing. And even if it turns out to be wrong, even if my definition of right thing is different from yours, it's fine. But like at every single decision that you make, don't just think from your perspective, don't just think from uh, whether it will succeed or fail, actually genuinely think whether it's the right thing to do in your own moral compass. If it turns out to be wrong, fine. We'll, We'll accept that. But in your own moral compass at that particular point in time, was that the right thing to do considering all shareholders or all stakeholders? Uh, so combining both of these, what it meant was that like we operated as a company where we had insanely high independence for the kind of people that we worked with. Uh, and these people over a period of time learned that you know they did not ever have to watch their backs because they trusted other people to take care of themselves, which meant that they could be more independent compared to other companies, which meant that they could take more risk compared to other companies, which meant that they were learning and growing at a faster pace compared to other companies. Um, and which meant that these people obviously were more entrepreneurial in nature. So not just that uh, Pratipi folks have built good companies. Uh, in fact, like funnily enough, for example, Animal started as a hackathon idea within Pratipi. Uh, and like, except for Kirti, the other four co-founders were part of the same team that presented the hackathon idea. And because we always operate with like doing the right thing as a principle, we essentially advise them that let us get to the point where the idea makes sense before you even leave your job. So they work within Pratlipi for six months where they will work after work hours or on evenings to get to the point where they had their first real transaction on the platform. And the day that happened is when they moved out. And then like once you have had one transaction, then maybe there could be a million other transactions. And that is when they started basically building that. A similar story for Kutumba as well. So generally, I think like having that culture where we expect people to not have to wash their backs and where they can just focus on doing the right thing and uh, learning at a fast pace, growing at a fast pace, essentially just means that people have more time and more bandwidth uh, to pursue other things. And which essentially I think means that people are just slightly happier, slightly more motivated, slightly more ambitious than they would be at other places. So I think mostly it's just that. Also, uh, I would be amiss if I did not say that there's a huge bit of luck involved. I think we just got lucky in the sense that a bunch of good people wanted to work with us. And then a bunch of these good people wanted to leave and start their own companies. And hopefully they will build cultures uh, which are even better than Pratipi. Like what we learned from Free Charge and Flipkart, and hopefully we have done a better job at it. Hopefully Animal and Kutum and the future startups will learn from us and they will do an even better job at that compared to us. Uh, so that element of luck will always be there. And I also remember, Ranjit, one discussion we had uh, maybe four, five years back uh, was that just because you are a CXO or a, some head or CEO, investor, whatever it is, just because you have a title, you cannot come and say, this has to be done this way. Uh, bring data uh, and, and talk with data. So that, that removes people to be hired who have chip on their shoulders. Uh, in some uh, yes and no. So we like people who have chip on their shoulders, just the right kind of chip. Uh, so like people who are feeling insecure or underconfident, for example, or who are uh, not sure what they can achieve, that's generally a great idea because these people are always hungrier uh, and they're willing to go that extra mile to prove themselves, uh, sometimes to themselves and sometimes to other people around them. Uh, versus people who have a chip on the shoulder that, you know, uh, I am entitled to this because, uh, and that because could be I went to a great school, because could be like I was early 
uh, higher at whatever X company or that I'm a VC or that I have a lot of money, a lot of experience, whatever. That is the wrong, wrong kind of chip on the shoulder. Uh, so we like people with chip on shoulder where they're still hungry to prove other, people's, other people wrong. So I think that has always been the case. Uh, because of your point, I also remembered one other point and something that I'm not sure if my investors like, but uh, I keep on repeating that, uh, is that like we are very, very clear that whoever is doing something, they get to make the final call and it doesn't matter if you're the CEO or if you're an intern. Uh, so my board essentially gets to advise me, they get to argue with me, they get to hire and fire me, but they don't get to make my decisions. And the same applies even if you're an intern who just joined yesterday. So like I or my VP engineer uh, gets to advise them, we get to argue with them, we get to uh, debate whatever they are doing and all of that. But at the end of the day, like, the final decision lies to the intern who is going to be doing whatever is, that is that they are doing. And a lot of, it's not efficient, like it's bad in the short term. Obviously, chances are that my board knows more about strategy than I do. Chances are that Gauri knows more about technology than an intern who just joined yesterday. It's just that it's like more effective in long term. That intern is going to be learning and growing at a much faster pace because they make that mistake. And we always trade off effectiveness versus efficiency whenever we get to make that trade off. So, so that culture of empowerment was something that I, that I, that I, that I also noticed at WG. The other thing I noticed, Ranji, was that many people have changed roles within Pazali. So you start with something else, do something else, and it's totally okay. Um, and of course, you have to earn the right to do it in some sense, but but it's totally okay. And that to me, again, is some level of empowerment uh, to the team members, which just helps the uh, helps the company. Awesome. In fact, one of my favorite uh, career trajectories in India, for sure, has been McKin, right? Like, Mekin joined as an engineer, then became head of engineering, then became head of people. And this is one of the things that we learned from Flipkart, like one of the many examples. So in Pratipi, for example, a lot of folks who are leading something, they are like 24, 25, uh, 26. Like the uh, head of Pratipi Comics is a guy who joined us as an Android engineer, did a front-end stint, did a back-end stint, did a PM stint, then he said, dude, I, like, I want to be a founder. He said, okay, we want to do it inside Pratipi, outside Pratipi. Said, like, I'm okay with both, just tell me what. I said, okay, why don't you think of something that you can do? So he came back with the idea of Pratipi Comics and he's now leading Pratipi Comics, which is, by the way, within a year and a half, the largest online comic player in the country. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, and uh, I'll, uh, I have a lot of questions in the, in the Q&A box here, but, but last question from my side uh, What is next for Pratipi? Where do you see Pratipi going from where it is over the next five, seven, ten years? Uh, that would be fantastic for people to know. Uh, so, like a disclaimer, this might sound arrogant. This is mostly random luck. So before I coached my co-founders, I had a chart paper in my flat, uh, which basically talked about if Pratipi succeeds, this is what we'll be doing more or less. Uh, and this was before I had Gautam Prashant who was my first co-founder. I think broadly, they're still doing the same things like 99% of the time. So I think we'll still be doing the same exact same thing that we are doing right now. Uh, just on slightly bigger scales, slightly more formats, slightly more languages, slightly more geographies. So the entire premise of Pratipi has always been that can be democratized storytelling across different formats, across different languages, across different geographies. It's strategically, it's just that you have to start with something, win that, and win the right to exist and expand from there. Uh, and that's what we have been doing. Uh, I think like we will be doing the exact same thing just across more formats, more languages, more geographies, uh, like over the next five, 10 years. So hopefully today, for example, we have, let's say about uh, all products combined, maybe 31, 32 million monthly active users. Can we have like a billion monthly active users? Uh, instead of being predominantly in India and 3% overseas, uh, can we have like 50 countries where we are the largest student platform? Uh, can we be having our own, for example, like Marvel Universe? Can we be having our own, like the next big game, like a PUBG, for example, or Candy Crush, for example, and so on and so forth. But it's like the vision is still the same. It's just about executing it at bigger, grander scale. And Ranjit, I remember, uh, of course, I, I would not remember numbers for every day, right? It's, I, I don't look at numbers in that much detail. Uh, I remember I was just coming, talking to someone and said, well, Pratilipi has X million DAU uh, or X million MAU. And I said, well, I think this was, this is not today. This was the number six months back. Uh, and, and in six months, we have become 2X. And, and you talked about it, that it's not that if there's any six months where we said like Pratilipi now grew a lot. It has been very consistent. 4x every four months, 4x four, four every year, like growth, simple growth, looks exponential on chart, but no, no place where there's a kink and then now it has, it has moved on. So, so when, when, when someone has asked this question that how did Pratilipi move from 
1 million monthly views, monthly uh, active users, 30 million monthly active users. What was the journey like? So first, let me correct the person who asked the question. We are not at 30 million monthly views. We would be like tens of billions of monthly views. So 30 million, maybe actually more than that. So that'd be hundreds of billion uh, monthly views. Uh, exactly. so, this exactly. of, so this is more of unique users and each user would easily have thousand plus views uh, for the literature product at least. <coughs> But the honest answer is like, there's no magic secret sauce. We are a boring company in general, I think. So for, I think even today, except for maybe like seven, eight people in the company now, and till about a year and a half back, the answer was zero people in the, uh, like 0.1% of my time, maybe. sorry, 10% of my time maybe. Uh, so we have never really focused on growth as a company. Our thesis has always been that like people should just focus on doing the right thing for the long-term perspective and growth is a happy byproduct. Obviously real life, you still have to manage your investors and you still have to, like lead a new, sorry, get a new round and all of that. So which is why 10% of my time would go in making sure that it still looks good, but that was never really the priority. The priority was like, if you're doing the right things, if you're improving your product, if you're improving your like, content experience that you have, if you're doing the right thing by your readers and writers, chances are that you'll just grow on your own. Uh, and there hasn't really been a magic hat. So like the way Pratipi's marketing team has evolved, for example, till about, so we hired uh, Sayantan, who is my marketing guy, about a year and a half, two years back. Uh, at that time, I think it was 22, by the way. Till then, we did not have a single marketing person in the team. So it was basically like anybody who wants to run marketing experiments and you could be a PM or an engineer or a customer service guy or whatever, uh, you had access to my marketing account, go and run those 10 experiments. Uh, it works, it doesn't work, doesn't matter. Like if it works, you scale it up. If it doesn't work, you shut it down and so on. Uh, and then 10% of my time would go into just teaching these people uh, because like, for example, as an engineer, you might not be used to seeing how Facebook ads work. Uh, and then basically it's optimizing these things around that, but that's largely it. Uh, and even today, generally, like we still have, I think four person marketing team or maybe five, uh, and we still basically run by the same premise. So we now do spend, of course, significant amount of money on performance marketing, but the premise is still is less of optimizing around a specific number and a lot more around uh, like are my experiments getting better over time? Is my CTR getting better over time? Is my uh, return uh, on the same investment that we are making better, getting better over time? Uh, like is my understanding of how different channels work getting better over time? And then a lot of experiments will not work. 10% of those that work, we'll just double down there. So the way we have grown has largely been just experimenting with a bunch of things and then doubling down on whatever has, working, has been working there. So there's no magic bullet. Thanks. And thanks for that question uh, uh, as well, uh, Abhishek. Uh, Multiple people have, have asked this question, and of course, we have talked about it, but it's good for you to say it in this forum as well. Text, audio, video, comics, there are multiple formats. Where do you see the future uh, of, of the ecosystem and Pratilipi both? Uh, what would be growing faster? Which would be larger? Uh, how do you think about it? Sure. So let me start with Pratilipi's specific answer because I think people find it more interesting because it's more weird. Uh, so at Pratilipi, you don't care. Like a lot of people ask me, for example, in fact, a lot of people compliment us uh, saying that, you know, uh, you are changing people's habits and people are now reading more, uh, more long form content, high quality content as against like low quality content, all of that. That's not really our primary goal. That's a happy side benefit. That's not why Pratipi exists. Uh, our premise has been fairly simple and that's true for the way we work, like how we hire people, how we promote people and all of that. That's also true about how we treat our customers. Our premise is fairly simple. If you want to read something, you should have access and opportunity to do that. If you want to listen to a podcast, you should have the access and opportunity to do that. If you want to listen to or uh, like watch a movie, you should have access to do that. Uh, you want to play a game, you should like, it should always be your choice. It should not be that uh, you want to read a comics in let's say Bengali and there is simply no Bengali comics available online. Like that should not be the case. So our premise is fairly simple. We want to be a storytelling platform where we have multiple different products to make sure that like, whatever you want to do, uh, you have access and opportunity to that. So whether video becomes big or text becomes big or audio becomes big or AR or VR or something else becomes big, doesn't really matter from our perspective. We are not into AR business. We are not into audio business. We are not into text business. We are into storytelling business. And like whatever formats evolve, we will evolve with them. Uh, that's the basic premise. Uh, so think of it like this. Like if you think of Uber, for example, as a black car or black taxi company, it would have died probably 10 years back. If you think of Uber as a taxi company, it would have done well, but it wouldn't have done this well. But if you think of Uber as a transportation company, uh, then wherever transportation is involved, Uber is relevant and transportation will evolve. Of course, tomorrow it's entirely possible that we have like something where you just click a button and like you can travel hundred kilometers in five minutes. 
but if your purpose is transportation, you will evolve with that as that need evolves and you will still be there just in a different way or form. So from Pratlipi specific perspective, we don't care. Now from an industry perspective, from an industry perspective, so there are two parts, right? Like so one part is that different formats or different uh, use cases require different formats because all formats have their own strengths and weaknesses. It's not that text is better than video. It's not that video is better than audio or vice versa. Uh, like the three predominant formats that we have today on the internet are basically text, audio, and video. And then of course, images and GIFs are coming along quite nicely. Now text, for example, is great because it's easiest to browse. Like you want to basically just figure out which of these 10 stories you want to read. That's easiest to do in text. Like it takes you two minutes to browse through something and figure out what you want to read. But there is zero parallelization. You can't read something and do something else. Uh, audio, for example, or let me start with video, for example. Video is relatively easy to browse, not as easy. How many of you, for example, go on Netflix and spend 15 minutes just trying to decide what to watch next? Uh, it's very, very hard to make that choice. Uh, in fact, people like me, for example, sometimes end up getting frustrated and not watching anything because I'm not able to choose what to watch next. But it's still doable. Uh, but, and there's some parallelization, like you can run a movie in background and maybe have a cigarette, for example, or for example, uh, play a game, but it's not like you can't really drive and watch a movie. Audio uh, as the third format, it's impossibly hard to browse. Like, have you ever tried to find out a new podcast on any podcast player? Not easy. It's very, very difficult to figure out what to listen to next, but parallelization is great. Like you can literally uh, co in fact, half of my engineering team, for example, uh, would be listening to something which could be music, which could be podcasts, which could be audio books while they are freaking programming. A uh, bunch of people listen to something while they are running, a bunch of people listen to something while they are driving. So parallelization is great, but browsing is very, very hard. And these are just two dimensions. There could be 15 other dimensions as well. So different formats are great for different use cases. And which is why I think that new formats will come because they fit better to a certain use case. Uh, and like, we will have to see how this evolves, but there would be different uh, formats. It's not that text is going to die. It's not that video is going to die. It's not that audio is going to die. It's just that all of these are going to evolve over a period of time. Like it will not look like what it looks today after 10, 20, 30 years, but it will still be there. That's my thought process for the industry. Awesome. Uh, I'm in the interest of time, I'll do one last thing. Uh, so there are some rapid fire questions that I have been asked to ask you. Uh, and I'll just shoot one by one. And whatever first comes to your mind, please shoot it away. Sure. Um, an awesome but unpopular app on your phone? Mm, probably Naver Web 2. Yes. Uh, one new habit that you have picked up during the lockdown? Uh, playing cricket after a long time. Uh, one book you would recommend as a must read for entrepreneurs? Actually, I'll recommend something else. I'll say just go and read whatever, like whatever you enjoy. You enjoy football, go and read about football. Like don't care about learning. A lot of people don't start reading because they care about what will other people think and all of that. Like just go and read whatever. Uh, which product you love the most globally? Depends on when you ask me. Uh, right now, it's probably still going to be probably YouTube. Let me go with that. Uh, you are not inspired by money as much based on what you have been talking, uh, uh, not by fame as well. So what inspires you really? Uh, just making the world a little bit better, like just helping people a little bit more than what I did yesterday. And of course, I have a guilty pleasure that I like uh, playing intellectual ping pong with the small people. Uh, so a lot of my decisions are made by that as well. Uh, I can adjust to that. Uh, in an alternate universe, uh, if you were not the founder of Pratilipi, uh, what would have you been doing? I think if I can go back and redesign my life, for example, I wouldn't be a founder. I would be an early employee uh, with a founder that I really respect and like. Like I would like to be a VP of something and I, I'm a journalist generally, so it doesn't even matter VP of what uh, with a great founder. So there's a lot of work that as a founder slash CEO that you have to do, which is just boring mundane work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, probably early employee at a tech company. And, and if not in the startup world, not in the tech world, then what would you have been doing? Chances are that I would be doing something with words. So I might be a lawyer, I might be a commentator, I might be a writer, like something to do with words and stories, almost certainly. What is your superpower and what is your weakness, according to you? I think my super, like biggest superpower probably is the ability to compartmentalize things. Uh, so for example, I could literally have my one arm uh, broken and I would, if I have to focus on something else, I would still be able to focus on that. 
uh, and like just the ability to cut through bullshit and get to the main point in general. Uh, my biggest weakness, I think, is that I'm not great at making people feel appreciated enough. Uh, it's not that I don't appreciate people. It's just that I'm not good at making people feel that way. Uh, so a lot of times people would work with me uh, and they will feel that, you know, they are doing a terrible job and not because they are, they are doing a great job. It's just that I'm not telling them that they are doing a great job. That would probably be my biggest weakness right now. This is awesome. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, it was a fun conversation. Thank you, Ranjit, for, for being candid uh, and, and articulate as always. Uh, appreciate it. Hope you guys had fun. And, uh, and thank you again. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye.